Can a rapier cut? Can a small sword? Hi folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gladiatorius. So I'm going to try and keep this relatively concise, even by my standards. Right, so first of all, I'm going to keep this super, super simple. Fundamentally, anything with an edge can cut, okay? So even some things which don't seem to have an edge can cut under the right circumstances. This stick, if I accelerate this stick to circa 800 miles an hour and hit it into someone's body at 800 miles an hour, you will find it will probably cleave them in half. Uh, so yes, even this stick can cut with enough velocity applied to it. But in terms of human powered things, I can't accelerate anything up to 800 miles an hour. I was gonna say unfortunately, but I don't know what I'd even do with that skill if I could. If you are holding a sword and it has an edge, then yes, it can cut. That doesn't mean it can cut well, and also let's qualify what an edge is. So, fundamentally, edges have angles, okay? So there are two elements to whether something will, in realistic terms, cut or not cut. Number one is, what is the edge bevel angle, okay? As we get closer and closer to 90 degrees, most human-powered objects will stop the stop being able to bisect clothed enemies easily okay so once something approaches 90 degrees even a bit less than that maybe 75 degrees it will not cut very well most medieval swords or 19th century sabers are usually somewhere down towards about 45 40 degrees even less sometimes certain types of sword are all the way down in if we get something to in fact certain types of knives down to about 20 degrees so there's a question of edge angle here, okay? Why is that important? It's especially important when you're talking about narrow blades because narrow blades have to have a certain amount of thickness, otherwise they wouldn't be strong enough to be used, okay? So when you're talking about something which has a certain thickness here and a certain width here, it means that the edge bevel is going to be wider, it's gonna be a larger angle than something that's wider and perhaps in some cases flatter, like a medieval sword, okay? The broader the blade is, the more shallow or smaller that angle can be be to the cutting edge. So edge angle is one element of it. The other major element of it is sharpness. Now sharpness is a funny one because how sharp is sharp? Fundamentally uh, a chisel can have a very broad angle but can be very finely polished on the edge such that when you hammer into wood with it it will quite happily um, take out chunks of wood. Similarly, some axes have very broad edges but can be very finely honed or, or polished such that they have a very fine and sharp edge and they can be, you can shave with them, you can pop hairs off with them. In fact, you can get this degree of sharpness even with a broad 90 degree angle. But here's the kicker. If something is super polished and sharp at 90 degrees angle, it can be really really sharp and you might if you run your finger along it it might cut your finger but if you're swinging a thing into a target taking a weapon and trying to cleave through clothes or into flesh and bone the fact is that a 90 degree angle will usually be too much resistance to pass through the target so even though with a draw cut or a push cut it might cut skin it's not going to cleave very well because you've still got a 90 degree angle providing too much friction to passing through the target we've also got the question here of what are you hitting and there have been some famous examples of people taking a blunt sword and demonstrating that the sword is blunt and then at high speed cutting through a tatami mat or a water bottle now tatami mats and water bottles, surprise, surprise, aren't clothing over flesh and bone. So how they react is often sometimes different. And yes, you can cut through a tatami mat, not easily, but you can cut through a tatami mat with a blunt to the touch blade, so long as it has good edge geometry. Equally with a water bottle, you can blast through a water bottle with a fast enough moving object with good edge alignment. It doesn't necessarily need to have a sharp edge. But just comparing those two things, a water bottle has a hard exterior and a, a watery interior area, a tatami mat is essentially straw. Um, so neither of those are particularly good analogues to flesh and bone, and neither is ballistic gel. Ballistic gel was um, purely designed really to test 
ballistics, hence the name, bullets. Um, so it's actually not a very good analogue for testing blades on because blades behave differently in that gel than bullets do. So let's come back to rapiers and small swords. Well, quite simply, and I'm going to keep this as simple as possible, it depends on the rapier and it depends on the small sword. Often in videos of mine, you will have heard me refer to types of rapier or types of small sword which cannot cut. I stand by that in many, many cases. Obviously, if you accelerate it to 800 miles an hour, like the stick, then yes, indeed, it might bisect a target. However, human powered, under normal circumstances, against clothing, flesh and bone, some of these swords will not cut. Here I have an original, uh, early 18th century, probably about 1720, Collishmard small sword. Now, the typical small sword of the 18th century has a triangular blade. So let's just have a look at that up close. You will notice that, so therefore, it has a ridge on one side and a hollow on the other side. It's exactly like an epee blade, and it's where the design of the epee blade comes from. Ridge on one side, hollow on the other side. So in other words, we have two edges here, one edge kind of here, mid-rib here, okay? Now, could these edges be sharpened up to be super sharp? Yes, they could, and they're not, and I've never seen an original that was, primarily because they didn't expect these swords to cut. Uh, and we see that in foil fencing, which foil fencing comes from the use of the small sword. There are no cuts in foil fencing because they didn't expect small swords to cut. But nevertheless, this, could be polished so thin that if I do this, it will cut skin, or do this and it will cut skin. This is an original, this is a real one, this is not sharpened like that, but you could possibly make those two edges sharp enough to do that. However, it's a triangle. That means that the angles here, we've got essentially one, if we're cutting the target, you've got a flat side here with a hollow in it, and on this side you've got a mid-rib with the two other faces of the triangle. That is going to have a huge amount of resistance cutting through anything like clothing or even through flesh. So even if you polish this up, it's going to have a terrible, terrible cross-section at passing through any kind of target. Moreover, look at the mass distribution of this, of this sword. It's incredibly thin and narrow up here. It's got very little, um, very little inertia with the tip, very little mass towards the tip. And the point of balance is about two fingers in front of the guard. Okay, so even though I could whack someone uh, and across the face and it would really hurt, it might even gash them slightly just with the speed of the motion of it, it cannot cleave, it cannot cut into limbs in the way that something like a sabre or a broadsword or a longsword can, okay? Now, that's one type of small sword. To throw a little spanner in the works here, here is an entirely different longsword, probably from about the year 1700. This is a German small sword, and you'll notice that the hilt is the same kind of design, except this one's in gilt uh, metal, somewhat larger as well, actually. But this, if you look at this blade, it's double-edged. It has proper edges. This is essentially a scaled down rapier or side sword blade, and that has two distinct edges. Now, because it has two edges and isn't humongously thick, the edge bevels aren't so bad with this. And this is, and clearly was originally, sharp to the touch. And it very clearly is intended to be able to give some degree of cut from the wrist with a moulinet. Uh, this is not going to cleave arms, it's not going to cleave legs, but a slash across the face, across the neck, across the hand, the wrist, the thigh. These surfaces where there's either no clothing or one layer of fabric, for example the thigh, then indeed absolutely you'll open someone up. And if you can, if you can nick an artery or you can just hamper a person by slashing them in the wrist or the hand with a manchette as it's called, in the middle of your otherwise point-centric fencing, if occasionally you can just smack them in the hand, you might disarm them, you might incapacitate them equally across the neck, you might open up an artery, this kind of stuff. So, absolutely there were small swords that cut, could cut, and there were small swords that by and large couldn't cut. Okay, now how does that relate to rapiers? It's basically the same. Okay, so on one hand we've got my uh, Donnelly Armourer's replica here of a sword in the Wallace collection. This is a sparring version with a blunt end. But that is clearly a long, narrow, 
blade like a side sword. It is double edged and has fairly reasonable edge geometry such that if this was made as a sharp, and I know this hits with quite a lot of authority, it's, a, it's about, it's under, it, I actually often refer to this as 1300 grams, it's actually under that, it's about 1270 or something like that. But anyway, um, I know that this hits with a lot of authority, similar to a sabre. Now it's not such a broad blade, it's not so easy to keep the edges aligned, blah blah blah, it's, it's straight, it's not curved, all this kind of stuff, so it's never going to cut quite as well as something like a cavalry sabre, but it has longer length, so when you actually have a moulinet coming from it, you have quite a lot of velocity at the tip, so absolutely similar target areas to what I mentioned for the cutting small sword there, side of the head, neck, uh, thighs, inside of the arm, hand, this kind of stuff. It's not going to do much if I, if I cut into someone's uh, torso wearing a doublet, but if I cut down to their thigh with only one layer of fabric over it, hell yeah, it's going to open them up. So this type of rapier could cut and absolutely was used to cut. The other element is treatises. We know from the fencing treatises that rapier treatises usually include some cutting actions. Okay, so if we look at Alfieri or, um, you know, Agrippa's fairly early one, but if we look at Fabrice or any of these, they've got cutting actions for the rapier. So the rapier was a cut and thrust sword, even if it was point centric, a lot of types of rapier, and I'm going to come to some that don't include this, a lot of types of rapier absolutely could cut and were used to cut. And some small sword treatises have cutting actions in them as well. Okay, right, finally, not all rapiers can cut. Now, a lot of people, uh, not, I won't say a lot, but a handful of people on the internet have got very annoyed about people who say rapiers can't cut. The fact is, which rapier are you talking about? Okay, so the rapier I've just shown, clearly if that was a sharp, it would cut. Clearly, loads of rapiers in uh, collections, in museums, can cut and were intended to cut. I was with Henry Yallop uh, not that long ago at the Royal Armouries and we were looking at some rapiers in the stores uh, and he was showing me that they have little flared tips. So they are specifically, even when they have very narrow blades, they actually flare out like a little leaf at the tip so that to give them more br breadth. So it comes back to the point if you make the blade broader, you can have a shallower edge bevel and that is therefore make it sharper and more adept at cutting. So you can have a really really narrow blade that gets a little bit broader at the tip for those uh, tramatsonia whatever cuts um, cutting from the wrist with a circular motion so you can you know aiming at the side of the neck or side of the face eyes thigh this type of inner, inside of the wrist this kind of stuff to have the maximum effect. But the fact is that there are some rapiers which will not cut Okay, and this is, this is something which some people seem to take real issue with, but it's a fact. You can go to the Wallace collection, you can go to the Royal Armouries, and there are some swords, and I have to say there's some examples, that's why I've picked up this cup hilt. Some examples are Spanish cup hilts or Italian cup hilts, um, and some of them, if you look at the end of the blade from there up, okay, maybe they'll cut down here, but you're not usually cutting people down here. Uh, but from here upwards, if you look at the cross section of the blade, they are square. They are literally square. The angles at the edges, because of the thickness of the blade and the narrowness of the blade, the angles are 90 degrees. If you have a blade that's completely square, it will not cut for toffee. It doesn't matter how polished you make that meeting of those two planes. They meet at 90 degrees, so they're never really going to do very much damage to anything at all. They will certainly do less damage than this really quite flat and finely edged small sword here. So there are examples, I'm holding one in my hand, where a small sword will cut better than some rapiers. So, to conclude, can you cut with a rapier? Can you cut with a small sword? Yes, if it has the appropriate blade type. And it's as simple as that. Some rapiers, much like S-stocks, um, I'm not saying S-stock is a type of rapier, but much like S-stocks can't cut because they have a triangular or square blade, some rapiers, which possibly was in English known as tucks, some of them have no ability to cut whatsoever. Yes, you can whack someone with something, and yes, it might really hurt, and it might even do some sort of damage to them, or it might even put them out of the fight, but you are not going to cleave with that type of blade. There are some rapiers, and l most types of small sword will not cut in practical terms, 
but there are lots of other rapiers which will cut. Some of them will cut really, really well, depending on the type of blade. Remember, it's always a trade-off between mass distribution, width, length, everything else. And there are a few types of small sword which are adapted to cut as well. And I know that this question will come up. Does that mean that this is a spadroon? God, there's a topic for another video. What do you think? Is this a spadroon or is this a cutting small sword? I would say it's a cutting small sword. Or a shearing sword, perhaps, according to McBain. Anyway, I hope this has been useful and thought-provoking. I'm always happy to hear opposing or differing ideas and thoughts, so get posting below. Start the discussion. Um, make sure that you're subscribed, because it means a lot to me. And uh, give us a thumbs up, and I hope I'll see you back on the channel really soon. Cheers, folks! Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.